All right. Well, again, good morning, everyone. For those of you who are just joining, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're a few minutes past three, but we want to be mindful of folks' time. Uh, we are recording this, which I'm sure you got a message uh, saying that as you join. So uh, soon we will be sharing out the recording from this and day two of the CAM workshop. Um, just want to start off by thanking you all so much for your interest in uh, being a CAM lead agency. Um, and we hope that today's presentations, as well as uh, the information that we're going to present tomorrow, um, will help you all as you are uh, planning for um, applying for the RFQ um, that will be released in late February, early March. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. My name is Tasha Gray, and I am the executive director of HAN. Uh, we are the continuum of care uh, and collaborative applicant and HMIS lead for uh, Detroit Highland Park and Hamtramck. And our role in this CAM transition is to really oversee the uh, transition itself and to uh, make sure that we are able to identify a new CAM lead agency um, and get that agency onboarded and uh, providing the same, if not better, quality of services from the um, for people who are experiencing homelessness and, and need to access our uh, crisis center, our crisis system. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through our presentation. Um, give me one second. There we go. All right, so uh, today uh, we'll be together almost until 12. Um, we uh, may go a little bit shorter than that, um, but we just want to give enough space for you all to be able to ask questions. Um, so things that we want to cover today is our, uh, we're going to do an overview of CAM um, or coordinated entry. Uh, that is going to include some of the history, uh, the purpose, um, how it got started here locally, and even some of the um, expectations from uh, our national perspective. We're also going to talk with you a little bit about uh, the funding that is available and um, what is needed in order to be eligible to apply for funding uh, related to the CAM. We'll share the RFQ timeline and uh, we'll close things out with uh, discussing some of the core elements of CAM as uh, required by HUD and how we operate it here locally. And then at the end, we'll have a, a, a Q&A, um, but you can also feel free as you go along to drop questions in the chat box. We have a few folks who will be monitoring the chat um, and responding to those questions. Also, I believe following um, the closeout of these workshops, we'll be developing a, a Q&A document that will be shared with you all as registrants and, and, and likely on our um, website as well. Um, and then we hope that you all will join us back tomorrow for day two of the CAM workshop. It will be additional information. So there was a lot of information. Um, and so we didn't want to try to cram it all into one meeting space, but we want to make sure that we provided uh, a, enough detail for you all to seriously plan, um, but also some space for you all to ask questions as you're planning. Um, so what we're really hoping from this meeting is to really give you all a jump start on your planning. As you know, um, or if you don't know, you'll know in this meeting is that again, we're planning on releasing the RFQ at the end of February or the beginning of March. And there will be about a 45 day window for applicants to respond to that RFQ, RFQ and submit their proposal. And so we recognize that that is not a lot of time to also do your planning and, and writing the application. Some of you all may have to um, develop partnerships that you don't uh, have in place right now and undertake other activities that a 45 day window may be too short for you all to do some of that. So we're hoping that today what you'll get from this uh, workshop and the workshop from tomorrow is just really the information that'll get you all started. 
we will, and I believe Amanda will speak to this a little bit later in the presentation. Once we release the RFQ, we will have another workshop that will be specifically going over uh, the expectations and the things that are detailed in the RFQ. So um, one thing I want to make sure I emphasize here is that um, a coordinated entry is a system. It is not um, just a program, right? Um, so it is part of our uh, houses, a crisis, uh, housing crisis response system. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of uh, details that you all are going to get today and just a lot of things for you all to think of beyond what you may think of when you're planning for, say, a rapid rehousing program or a permanent supportive housing. You're really going to think about how this um how coordinated entry really impacts our entire system uh, from uh, providers to the clients we serve and how that will work within your organization. Um, and so we're, again, wanting to make sure that we provide enough details for you all to really start your planning because it's a little bit different than planning for a, a, a program. And, and maybe I should say a lot of it different. Um, we hope that um, we don't scare you off today, but we really provide you with um, a, a realistic view of what it takes to implement coordinated entry, in particular, implementing it in uh, the city of Detroit. Um, so before I hand things over, um, just want to take a quick second and, and just hear from you. So if you all have a moment um, to drop in a chat, just for those of you who um, have either submitted a letter of intent, or you've been closely following this process uh, through the CAM transition, we want to hear from you and we want to know why you are interested in what are some of the things that interest you in being the CAM lead. So take a moment or so to uh, drop those things in the chat and um, we'll shout those things out as they're coming through the chat. And I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to hand things over to um, Kiana, who will uh, take us through some of uh, the CAM overview. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, just wanted to give a few highlights on uh, the purpose of CAM, or Coordinated Assessment Model, as we call it in Detroit. Uh, so CAM works in conjunction with a network of independently operating projects to form a fully integrated crisis response system. CAM is not, it is not a direct source of housing opportunities, but a single point of contact for our community partners. CAM's purpose is to connect people experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness to shelter and housing resources. So HUD requires each CLC across the nation to operate a coordinated entry system and require CLC and ESG funded programs to use that coordinated entry process. Some of the purposes of coordinated entry, again, are to create a consistent streamlined process for accessing the resources available in the homeless response, homelessness response system, prioritizing resources for the highest need and most vulnerable households. Ensuring housing and supportive services are used as efficiently and effectively as possible and transform a network of independently operating projects to a fully integrated crisis response system. So the redesigned system under the HEARTH Act. This particular slide is demonstrating um, what HUD's goal potentially was uh, when they started to think about what do we wanna do um, to coordinate services better. And so the concept um, was that individuals would flow into this kind of single point of entry um, called coordinated entry in, in Detroit CAM. And that coordinated process would determine, determine some type of housing exit strategy, whether it was shelter, rapid rehousing, PSH, TH, and so forth. Um, the goal 
uh, was to kind of move folks through um, this process. And as we talked about kind of the purpose um, under the Hearth Act, the vision was really the same. Um, a system that was organized, uh, working together were some essential parts of that vision, focused on system-wide goals and not just individual program goals, and having really specific defined outcomes were some of the uh, vision that uh, HUD had when, when they launched this. And on the next slide, we'll look a little bit at what they thought this timeline was going to look like many years ago. So this was HUD's lofty goal <laughs> to roll out coordinated entry across the nation. Um, really early on um, in 2012, which we were just coming down from the HPRP world <laughs> in uh, HUD, in the HUD world, we were coming away from that HPRP um, program that, that infused a ton of resources into many communities. Right after the new interim rule for the ESG came out in 2012, not too far after HUD started to codify more of what they meant by prioritizing individuals for permanent supportive housing. And by 2015, a coordinated entry policy brief had been dropped. They continued on um, and not until 2017 did HUD actually issue the coordinated entry notice. COCs had a deadline now. There was a checklist that was issued and that checklist had to be met by January of 2018. And then the following year, um, HUD came out with the data standards and coordinated entry elements. They were released in 2019, but did not have to be um, implemented until 2020. And on the next slide, I'll kind of tie in what happened in Detroit. So in Detroit, <laughs> we are always first. <laughs> That's what I'll say now. And Sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't, but we are usually first out the gate um, with uh, a lot of these initiatives. And we really started rolling CAM out soft in 2013. I want to remind you that the notice didn't come out <laughs> until 2016. I'm sorry, 2017. So we were operating about four or five years before the notice ever came out. Um, in 2014, we had a pretty robust year. That is when we introduced the SPADAT, which is the Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. We implemented that at family shelters. Uh, right after we started uh, looking at PSH placements, and that was as a result of an initiative some of you may remember called 25 Cities. The CAM call center officially went live in July of 2014. And towards the end of the year, we implemented the process, kind of closed the side doors for single shelter providers. And we did all of that in 2014. Um, 2015, we continued on and this became kind of a pilot year for us with permanent supportive housing. So we started to really get into this match process, but it wasn't necessarily mandatory, but we started encouraging providers to come to the table. We held tons of focus groups with providers to talk about like, what will this look like on the ground and how will this impact you um, if we make these changes? So we got a lot of community feedback. Outreach teams started to begin receiving and submitting coordinated referrals to CAM um, in 2015. And by the first quarter, about the end of the first quarter of 2016, we made a significant shift and closed the side doors for permanent supportive housing. And what that meant in Detroit is that all referrals for CLC funded units had to come through CAM. 
In the early years, this was a face-to-face -face meeting. It was required. Uh, it was mandatory. We all came together um, very frequently to do this matching in person for clients that we were serving in Detroit. As 2016 moved on and we got into 2017, we implemented our first access site for families. And we also implemented the chronic by name list, which became a direct focus for our street outreach and shelter navigators. And in 2018, we implemented the access site for singles and youth and our CAM call center that we launched in 2014 uh, went offline. So that is kind of the early years in Detroit. Uh, one of the other highlights I want to mention is that though HUD didn't come out with the data and element standards until 2019, we were entering data since 2014. So again, six years into the process um, before there was an official guidance from HUD, um, Detroit, you know, rose to the occasion together as a community and we just made it happen. I'm going to now turn it over to Scott, and he's going to bring us forward uh, to more recent years and timeline that's happening with coordinated entry. Scott? Thanks, Kiana, and good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Jackson, CAM Assistant Manager, uh, currently at Southwest Solutions. And as Kiana said, so picking up where she left off, around 2018, so really end of 2017, rolling into 2018, uh, we switched from the call center model, which had been the initial design of CAM, to a, a multi-site uh, in-person access. Uh, so internally, we had called that kind of CAM 2.0, uh, where we launched uh, initially three access point locations. Um, along with that, there were some other system changes to really try and make sure uh, system-wide we were doing diversion at CAM at the front door of shelter entry. So exploring with households, whether they might have um, alternative places to stay and if at all possible to uh, divert them from entering homelessness. And we also at that time, fully integrated assessment happening at the front door at CAM rather than at the shelters, uh, including doing the VI SPDAT um, when we were making shelter referrals, which we'll talk a bit more about a lot of this in detail when we really are kind of going over the CAM uh, core elements and operations. So moving forward from there, um, in the last few years, so in 2019, we made some changes to the prioritization policy, initially with the pilot period. Uh, we'll talk about prioritization as more as well. Um, right at the end of 2019, we were piloting additional access point locations, really with the idea of trying to build out that multi-site in-person access model to make sure there was access throughout the city of Detroit geographically. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, a lot of those plans got disrupted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic in March, 2020. Um, so I'm sure like all of you on the call, we had to figure out how to adapt in the midst of that at CAM and switched to fully remote phone-based operations. So in a lot of ways, uh, I guess for better or worse, going back to kind of those early days of the call center model. Um, and really since then, we've been figuring out on trying to manage the best way to provide access in uh, kind of the ongoing pandemic, post-pandemic world of providing the benefits of the phone service uh, while also exploring other options. So really since 2020, there's been times we were fully remote. We went back to a hybrid model at one point and then back to fully remote. Um, currently, we're fully remote again. Um, so I think we'll talk in more detail about access, but just wanted to kind of highlight that. Um, you'll also see on here, uh, we implemented Salesforce in 2020, which is an internal data system that we use that we'll talk a lot more about tomorrow in our workshop. And then one big thing I realized I forgot to include in this timeline is that in 2021, uh, we fully integrated uh, the general population coordinated entry process with the veteran process so that we had a shared policies and procedures and that uh, anyone experiencing homelessness, veterans, non-veterans alike could follow the same process and make sure they're getting connected to the um, 
appropriate services. And so we coordinate really closely uh, with the VA. Um, we have staff on site there and have a shared kind of entry process for coordinated entry for both systems. Um, and then are working closely at CAM to make sure veterans are getting connected to the appropriate uh, veteran services. Um, and then obviously, as you all know, bringing up to the present day, um, in September 2022, Southwest decided to relinquish their role as the lead agency, which is leading to us all here today. So I think I will stop there and pass it back over to hand staff for the next slide. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we just have a couple of more slides related to the overview. Uh, just wanted to bring to your attention that, you know, CAM, uh, we've mentioned quite a bit about individual programs and partners and system partners are a critical part of CAM. For navigation system partners, we have shelter navigation partners and we have street outreach navigation partners. And uh, Scott, mentioned, they will go into more of that and when they talk about access and, and navigation and what these partners actually do. On the next slide, we would like to highlight some of our other system partners. We have referral partners and the referral partners encompass emergency shelter, transitional housing, prevention, rapid rehousing, as well as permanent supportive housing. And these are the list of our current partners that we are partnering with in the Detroit COC. I'm gonna now turn it over to Amanda Sternberg who will lead us into funding and eligibility. Thanks, Kiana. Thanks, Scott. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Amanda Sternberg, also with the Homeless Action Network of Detroit. So we wanted to um, start off uh, these uh, this two-day workshop with just laying some uh, perhaps foundational information on who's even eligible to apply to become the new CAM lead agency. And probably the question on everyone's mind is what resources are available for that new lead agency to implement this programming. So we want to you know, make that clear uh, from the get-go. So agencies who are eligible to apply once we release the RFQ um, need to fit into one of three categories, either be a nonprofit organization, a unit of state or local government, or be a public housing entity. And those are the entities that are eligible to apply because those are the entities who are eligible to receive uh, continuum of care funding from HUD. As we'll see in a moment, that COC funding is a key part of the funding that funds coordinated entry. And so in order for an agency to be eligible to receive those funds, they need to be one of those three types of entities. Um, additionally, uh, the RFQ may include some additional threshold criteria that we're gonna wanna see applicants to meet. That is still in development. Um, you'll probably hear that phrase quite a bit over the next two days, things that are still in development. Uh, as we know, the RFQ is not final. So things that are in the works will indicate that um, as, as we go along. One other thing to say, like it, um, in order to be able to receive the HUD funding um, that is going to fund these services, an entity will need to be registered in SAM, the Systems for Award Management. If uh, you are an entity that already receives federal funding, you will already be registered. We can provide more information or guidance on that um, when the time comes, but just know that that is a requirement for receiving uh, federal funding. You can go to the next slide. So this table provides just a high level overview of the sources of funding that are currently available to be received by the new lead agency. I'm gonna go over each of these in a little bit more detail, um, but essentially there's uh, four sources of funding currently. One of those sources that new lead agency will need to um, uh, kind of demonstrate on their own where it's gonna come from, um, but the total amount of, this is annual funding as well, is approximately $1,364,057. So just under $1.4 million annually. We can go to the next slide. Um, so now I'm gonna go over kind of each of these funding sources uh, individually. So the first source of funding that will be available for the new CAM lead agency is the HUD uh, Continuum of Care 
coordinated entry grant or CESSO grant. So this is a grant that is currently held by Southwest Counseling Solutions uh, for them to uh, support the coordinated entry work that they do. Um, and this grant would be transferred to the new lead agency once that entity is identified. The amount of the grant, you can see there, it's uh, about $960,000, a little shy of that. The and this is a because it's a continuum of care grants, these grants are renewable on one year cycles um, during the annual competition. So, this, this grant likewise um, is renewable annually as a part of the COC competition. Um, but this is really the one of right now the uh, kind of main source of funding for uh, coordinated entry activities. The uh, second kind of point that you'll see here on this slide, which is the second source of funding is the match that is required for this COC grant. Um, all continuum of care grants are required to demonstrate at least 25% of their grant amount in match funding. So those match requirements will apply to the new lead agency. Um, the match requirements are about $240,000. And we will provide some more details in the RFQ on, you know, what you can use as match, all those details around match uh, for, for uh, uh, people that may be unfamiliar with that. But just know that in, within the RFQ, the applicant agency will need to describe and demonstrate how they will uh, be able to provide for this match funding, because ultimately the, the COC grant uh, the entity will be the direct recipient, and they will have to demonstrate to HUD anyway their match, how they're meeting those match requirements. Um, so we're going to kind of make sure um, up front that that entity will be able to meet those match requirements. The next source of funding is a little bit, it's a smaller uh, pool of money, but it's um, emergency solutions grants or ESG funding um, that is uh, comes through the Michigan State Housing Development Authority or MISHTA. Um, the, it's a relative, like you say, a smaller amount right now, it's about $36,000. Um, and that's to help the purposes of this ESG funding is to help support the work of the CAM lead agency in their role as the HARA. Um, we're going to be talking more about what that HARA everything uh, entails either later today or tomorrow, uh, but just know that there's that little, there's a little bit of funding from MISHTA uh, available to support those efforts. Uh, that grant term is, you know, you can see there an October to September grant term. Um, the one thing too about this MISHTA ESG grant is that HAND acts as the fiduciary for those funds and then it's subgranted to the CAM lead agency. Um, just to emphasize earlier, the HUD COC grant, the CAM lead agency enters into that grant agreement directly with HUD. Next slide. Um, so the final source of funding that we currently have available is through the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, or YHDP. Uh, hopefully everyone is familiar and aware that uh, Detroit was awarded YHDP funding. Um, about a year ago now, I think we got the award. So we have a lot of really exciting stuff happening overall with the YHDP program, which will help to um, increase access to different housing resources for youth who are experiencing okay. homelessness. And as a part of that programming, uh, coordinated entry is a key piece of it. So um, with this YHDP funding, there are uh, currently plans and strategies that are being developed and implemented to help ensure that young people who are experiencing homelessness are able to access coordinated entry. So um, Southwest Counseling Solutions, as the current CAM lead agency, is currently receiving some of that YHDP funding to carry out those coordinated entry activities. Uh, those funds, likewise, uh, will be transferred to the new lead agency uh, for them to pick up and carry on that work. Uh, one thing that maybe is a little unique about this YHDP funding is that our community has already developed what we desire um, coordinated entry to look like uh, for the YHDP programs and with these funds. Again, more details will be in the RFQ, um, but just know that the new lead agency will really be expected to um, carry out those uh, that, that plan and that vision as um, has already been developed through the YHDP process. The YHDP funds right now, uh, they are two-year grants. The amount that you see on the screen 
um, about $129,000 is just the one-year portion of that two-year grant. Uh, this is another grant where HAND acts as the fiduciary, and uh, that will be then entered into a subgrant agreement with the new lead agency. Um, so one thing that I, uh, yeah, just before we go to the, the time, I have a couple of minutes here, just uh, some things for agencies to consider. Um, just again, the point of these workshops are to help you uh, think through what you may need to do to prepare. A um, couple of thoughts or things for you to uh, consider. Number one is if your agency has the administrative capacity to manage different sources of funding that are going to have different timelines, different reporting requirements, uh, different regulatory requirements, different allowable uses. Um, there's a lot that goes on with administering federal funding, and particularly federal funding that may, again, have different timelines or different uses. So we're, again, these are going to be questions that will be asked in the RFQ, but we're really going to be looking for agencies that have the capacity to be able to manage um, this type of funding. And the secondly, uh, something to consider, particularly as it relates to that HUD uh, COC grant, which again is about $960,000, uh, you may want to consider if receiving and expending that amount of Funding will then require your agency to have what's called a single audit or an A133 audit. Those audits are required if you spend a certain amount of federal funding in a given year. Your agency may already be at that point, or it, it may not be. Um, so that may be something to consider if that receiving that additional federal funding would kind of then trigger those audit requirements. The A133 audit is uh, not inexpensive. It's going to be a, it's a pretty costly thing to have done, but it is a requirement if you expend, I think it's $750,000 in federal funding in a calendar year. Um, so just something to keep in mind um, as you consider, you know, moving forward through this process. Um, okay, uh, we can go to the next slide. So I want to touch on the timeline. So the RFQ timeline and what you can expect in the months to come. So as Tasha has uh, alluded to, our goal is to release the RFQ, the request for qualifications, uh, by the end of February, say end of February, early March, to sort of give ourselves a bit of a buffer. Uh, but the goal is really by the end of February. After the RFQ is released, we will schedule a workshop, a webinar, kind of specific to the content of that RFQ. That's what we you know, typically do when we release uh, funding applications. So after the RFQ is released, applicants will have about 45 days to submit their application. So applications will be due um, in about mid-April. Again, specific due dates will obviously be communicated uh, through the RFQ, but this is just to kind of help you prepare. So mid-April is when uh, responses will be due. Then from mid-April to late May will be the review process. So we will have a panel of reviewers reviewing, evaluating those applications. Um, we are also hoping to, uh, depending on how the applications shake out, um, we may have an interview process as well with the applicant agencies just to help us all get a better understanding of uh, who you are as an agency. But then by late May, the, we, uh, the goal is that a recommendation will be developed on which new lead, new, uh, which entity should be the new lead agency. And that recommendation will then go before the COC membership. So uh, according to the COC's governance charter, the uh, coordinated entry lead agency is what we call a designated entity, uh, which means that it's the COC membership that makes the final uh, decision on who that entity is going to be. So at the end of May, a recommendation will come before the COC membership to vote on. Um, they will then vote uh, whether to you know, approve or not approve that recommendation. Assuming that recommendation is approved, we will then know who the new lead agency is. At that point, as we move into early June, a lot more work will start to happen. Um, a lot more timelines will need and details will need to be fleshed out. But that's then when we will start the process of transferring that HUD COC grant to the new lead agency. Um, that will need to be done uh, starting in June so that by the time that grant comes up for renewal in the 2023 competition, it can be submitted under the new lead agency. But then really between June and the end of August, 
there's going to be a lot more planning uh, for that transition as the new lead agency really kind of ramps up the operations and a Southwest hands over uh, you know, some of those, uh, it's we kind of have this overlay between one agency starting um, and the other agency preparing to step away from uh, those duties. Um, so that's the kind of a broad timeline, again, of the uh, RFQ development. Um, again, spe more specific dates will be communicated as we have them. Um, so um, I'm not sure, do we, did we want to take some questions now that came up in the chat or did we want to, I think I may have a, a little bit of, we're ahead of schedule, Amanda, so if you want to take some questions, feel free to. Sure. Okay. Um, so one question is, does the MISHTA uh, grant count as match, the MISHTA ESG grant? Um, so the age-old question of if you can use ESG to uh, <laughs> be used as match. Maybe. That's the, uh, I will say, maybe. It, there's a lot of, like, it depends on how you're going to use the funds, how, you know, how the funds will be used. So um, we can, uh, again, in the RFQ, we will do what we can to, to clarify that, like the, the, the maybe. Um, the question is, how does Southwest meet their match? So um, I, I don't know exactly off the top of my head how Southwest meets, meets their match requirements. Um, you know, they certainly have different sources of funding, have had different sources of funding over the years that they've uh, been able to tap into to meet their match requirements. Um, I will say that, you know, whatever sources of funding they're using as match, if they were not included in the that grid as funding that's available to be transferred to the new lead agency, then those would be funds that, you know, are not transferable, I guess, you know, so other sources of funding could be other fundraising dollars that they just, you know, raised privately, um, could have been a number of, of uh, sources that they could have used as match. Um, uh, okay, Katie, thank you for your comment. We'll go a lot more into YSDP tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. Um, oh, Tasha, thank you. I see you responded to that question about the match. Okay. Um, so, uh, Linda's question is, what impact does becoming the CAM have on other grants that uh, you receive to run your shelters? Is CAM able to receive other COC grants for operations, et cetera? Um, so let me think through. So the coordinated, let me, I will try to kind of answer this question. So the funding that's received for coordinated entry, for example, the coordinated entry, uh, the HUD COC grant, is you know must be used to support the operations of coordinated entry um, agencies that receive. Oh, well, let me back up. So I will just use Southwest as an example. This is no secret. Southwest receives other COC funding for permanent supportive housing um, and for rapid rehousing. So they have absolutely separate other grants to to do other housing activities within their agency. Um, those those you know those programs are operated as distinct programs, housing programs. Coordinated entry is operated as the coordinated entry kind of system as it is. So agencies that, um, you know, are the coordinated entry lead, are the CAM lead agency and then receive the COC funding, there's, there's nothing that would preclude them from applying for or receiving other COC funds to do other programming. The one thing, and I think we'll go into this a little bit more too either, uh, today or tomorrow, is that there really is an expectation that the, the CAM lead agency, uh, that there's no conflict of interest or that you're able to separate out the activities that are coordinated entry and other housing or service activities that you as an agency may operate, whether it be shelter activities, permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, et cetera. Um, there really needs to be a distinction between those functions within uh, the organization. Um, so I don't I don't know, I hope that helps to, if that doesn't really clarify, you can uh, feel free to ask some more. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so with that, you can feel free to go ahead and put stuff in the chat. Um, I, we do wanna kind of keep us moving. So I am going to, I hand it over to, I think, Kiana and Tasha to take us to the next piece. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. 
Um, I'll start off. Uh, so um, you've heard a lot of information right now. As Amanda said, a lot of this today information is kind of laying the foundation, but we are definitely going to, from this point for, forward, uh, from today and tomorrow, really start going into some of the details of operating coordinated entry and particularly operating it in the Detroit COC. So I want to start with giving you an overview of what HUD's expectations are around coordinated entry. Um, and then you'll hear from some of the current CAM staff as well as some of HAND staff around what that looks like here locally. So HUD has four core elements of coordinated entry. And again, you'll hear us use coordinated entry and CAM interchangeably. The formal term is coordinated entry, but here locally we refer to it as CAM. So those four uh, core elements are access, assessment, prioritization, and referral. Generally speaking, Access means how are people going to access your system? When uh, Kiana was speaking earlier, she walked through some of the various models. Kiana and Scott, when they were speaking earlier, they walked through some of the various models that we've used in the past for access. For example, when we first started CAM, we had a, a call center, and that's how folks who were experiencing homelessness and needed a referral to a shelter or uh, to another housing program, that's how they accessed our system. Um, from there, we moved into an in-person model where instead of having that call line, people came to different access sites located uh, in various places throughout the city. Um, and as Scott mentioned, we tried to expand those uh, access sites and then COVID hit. Um, there uh, has also been times where we've operated in a hybrid model where a person could walk in and or call uh, a number in order to uh, receive a referral for a shelter, shelter or other uh, housing services that may be offered through the CAM. So in general, um, what HUD's requirement is, is that there is some sort of standardized way in which people access uh, your system. And it may vary across communities. So what it looks like here in Detroit versus what it looks like on the west side of the state in Grand Rapids, um, there is a, a lot of flexibility for that to vary. Uh, HUD doesn't uh, dictate what that looks like. Um, we have uh, the discretion locally to decide what works best for our community. And so we'll talk a little about how we, how folks access the center currently, and then maybe even outline some expectations for in the future how folks will access the center, access our, uh, the CAM services. Um, the next A uh, is assessment. And so really, again, HUD is looking for a standardized way in which people are assessed. So if I show up uh, at an access center and you show up at an access center, we should be assessed in a standardized way. And so that means as I share my information with you um, in terms of my experiences as homelessness, you may uh, there may be an assessment tool. Currently, we're using an assessment tool called the SPADAT or the Service Prioritization Decision Assessment Tool. Um, and so we use that assessment tool to uh, be able to um, uh, make, triage folks and determine uh, what is the uh, most appropriate referral for them based on their uh, circumstances, their history, um, and then what's also available in our um, community. We also have to work, uh, be uh, mindful of prioritization. And basically, prioritization recognizes that uh, despite our best efforts, there is just not enough resources to serve everyone who is homeless that presents in our community. And as such, we uh, have to have some factors in which we uh, decide who receives the next referral that comes available. And so uh, there are some policies and procedures that as a community, we have decided on how we prioritize people for the next available referral. And then that leads us into the last of the core elements that HUD expects, which is the referral. 
And that is at the point in which our, our CAMLI agency, after they've gone through the assessment and the prioritization process, they determine which agency or which program that they will make a referral to. And that, again, that referral is based on that person's history, um, their need, their current needs, and what's available in our system. So now I'll hand things over to Kiana and um, she'll give us more uh, details on uh, some of these core elements. Thank you, Tasha. So I just want to uh, now set the stage um, prior to us going into the very, very uh, explicit details about the core elements, but set the stage about the plan. Uh, this is the plan flow for coordinated entry and CAM, you know, in Detroit. And I will say, you know, our current providers, you know, have done a really great job of creating, adjusting, <laughs> adjusting many, many times and implementing these plans. Um, and I'm emphasizing plan, okay, for a reason. Um, this is, you know, what we hope will happen, right? As you flow through our system in Detroit. But as you all know, you know, this work is not simple. This work is not easy. And everything doesn't always go as planned. Um, CAM is serving people. And people don't always, you know, fit the plan, even a plan that they're part of and part of developing. Um, I think it is really important to think about being flexible. Um, having flexibility as a CAM lead is essential, as well as knowledge and savviness about resources. As individuals, families, and youth experiencing homelessness come through our system, one of many things may occur, but uh, having the plan or having you know some kind of foundation is still equally important um, so that you kind of know what you should be doing, but also at the same time, um, being willing um, to have that flexibility so that you can meet everyone's needs as much as possible. I think that all staff, you know, that are willing and able to make adjustments and be flexible um, is just going to be essential um, as we look for the newly agency. I am now going to turn it over to Ed and Scott as they talk about more details about these essential elements as they are currently functioning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so first we'll talk about access and access is kind of, it's the front door to everything, you know, the services, well, not services, but um, just the response system, the referral system, prioritization system. It's really where everybody accesses everything, of course. Um, so we're designed to serve individuals, families, and youth. Um, so anyone over 18, um, we don't directly service minors, but we do, absolutely get a lot of calls and um, I don't say a lot, but a few calls from minors. And we work with outside partners and providers that do, you know, work with minors. So um, we work through, um, you know, people experiencing literal, literal homelessness. Um, so category one, but we do receive plenty of calls from people experiencing category two, which is, you know, house to house and hotel and people that may not have anywhere to go tonight. So, and then of course, um, fleeing domestic violence. While we don't directly refer to any uh, domestic violence shelters directly, we do have a strong partnership with the YWCA um, and where navigation services do happen. And we do all uh, partner with them, engage their clients for access and get them enrolled. Um, so we have had a few different systems, in-person, phone-based and hybrid. Um, so in person, uh, before COVID, we had mm, three, three main access points. Um, one is Southwest Solutions Housing Resource Center that um, strictly saw fam or was designed for families and youth. And then we had NSO Tumani Shelter, which um, saw a majority of our singles. And we were also at NOAA Project. Uh, so once COVID hit, we did go to a purely phone-based model, which has its um, positives and negatives, as we uh, most of us know. 
Um, so people are able to reach us without needing to come down to an in-person site, which with people that may have issues with transportation, mobility, definitely a good way to go. But we also know how call centers can be an extremely high call volume that we receive and the issues there. So there's also the hybrid model, um, which is probably the best that most equitable that people can also reach us via phone, you know, may have those mobility issues or people can come see us in person. Now, I will say with access for the in-person and phone-based, um, it's definitely a good idea to spread the access points throughout the city and not have just one centralized location because you do see an increase of people and kind of some of the similar issues on phone base where there's a long wait time. Um, so the more spread out they can be, um, the better. Uh, next slide. So um, for access, uh, we do a couple, before we look at shelter referrals, we look at diversion. Um, diversion is a problem solving conversation with anybody experiencing homelessness and trying to find an alternative option to shelter. So um, we all know shelter spaces are extremely limited. So trying to find those safe options for everybody is extremely important. Um, so CAM always works on a safe place for the night, not necessarily long term. Um, so we understand staying with family and friends may not be, you know, possible for two, three weeks or you no know, forever. But hey, can you stay there tonight? It's better than maybe doing an overflow option or, you know, definitely being in a car or anything like that. Ultimately, though, of course, if somebody identifies that they do not have a safe space, we'll look into shelter referrals, possible walk-ins, overflow options to just ensure somebody has at least, you know, a safe place for the night. Um, so prevention is another thing that we do um, do assessments for. So based on our, uh, our conversation with the individual um, and they were be, they were able to be successfully diverted um, into a you know family friend or hotel category two situation, we complete an assessment that is currently done through Salesforce, um, which is I think about 10 questions and there's a scoring on it. And based on those, we uh, prioritize them for prevention referrals um, and make referrals when our agencies, can, when our providers contact us. Um, next slide. Oh, real quick, I'm sorry. For diversion, we do have some financial assistance that we uh, can help with. So food cards, food vouchers, gas cards, bus tickets, and security, first month security deposit through the current diversion grant. So um, the main thing that a lot of people with access um, know about us is shelter referral. So um, we do uh, partner with um, the D or COC shelters. I want to say there's, don't, I'm going to get the number wrong, but I want to say around 14 or so, but that we partner with uh, single shelters uh, and family shelters that we make referrals to. So we, we enter information into, you know, HMIS through a HUD entry, make the referral through there. Um, once we do uh, make that referral, we also sign or um, coordinate with our navigation teams to uh, start the housing documentation process and getting on the different prioritization lists, which we'll talk about in just a minute. We also refer to street outreach um, through um, not necessarily a direct referral, but we fill out a smart sheet through the city of Detroit, who coordinates with the um, outreach teams in the city to ensure that they're being engaged. The outreach teams can also do, do the same thing as us, but they skip over maybe some of the shelter diversion prevention. Though we do work with some of the some of the teams. They got somebody that may be able to go out of town, you know, say with a family member out of town or be diverted with some, some assistance. So we do work with them in that capacity many times. And um, when we do meet with the street outreach team, we also do have an HMI or meet with somebody who is uh, deciding to not go to shelter. We do uh, engage them, do enter some stuff in HMIS, and um, you know make the referral. Okay, wait five ten minutes. Next slide, please. So, um, as we talked about for coordinated entry intake, we do do a few different type of intakes and entries. Um, so for diversion, it's a problem solving conversation, of course, 
And then we complete a basic entry with them, which is a pretty simple entry, just basic information with um, both the head of households and uh, any family members that may be part of it. For shelter, there's two types. There's the HUD entry and then the vet VA entry. Um, so the VA entry is for veterans specifically. And um, that also includes um, the veteran by name list assessment and the normal HUD, uh, HUD data entries. Um, so based on what's going on with the client and how they're presenting, we may complete uh, a single family or youth VI. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, is a short standardized assessment used to gather information on people's vulnerability, needs, preferences, and barriers. While this is one of the key things for prioritization, it is not the main factor, but it is kind of used to see um, where you know what's going on currently in the individual and family uh, situation. So we also do deal with uh, specific populations, youth and veterans. As was mentioned a little bit earlier, we talked about more is the youth by name or youth asset YHDP assessment, um, which is a few questions more aimed at our youth specific clients. And then, as I mentioned, we do complete the VBNL assessment also. Um, so, navigation, uh, scheduling, coordination once an individual is seen by our CAM assessors, they are then scheduled through Salesforce to be seen by the navigation team, CHS. Um, we schedule them through, uh, through Salesforce and they uh, pull the list off that of who's currently in shelter and follow up with that. Um, so navigation will take, get together the homeless history and document chronicity. They'll complete a full spadat if necessary, depending on the outcome of the VI. They may complete a housing choice voucher pre-app. And like I said, they'll assist clients with getting um, housing documentation. They'll help them get um, when they are pulled for a referral. And I will go ahead and pass it over to Scott. Thanks, Ed. I know Linda had a question about prevention. Maybe Ed, you can address that in the chat and we can circle back to it. Uh, if there's further questions, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so hi again, everyone. Uh, so speaking in more detail on prioritization, as Tasha said earlier, one of the core elements of coordinated entry is prioritization, recognizing that um, there are unfortunately are not enough resources to serve everyone currently experiencing homelessness. And so there's a need to determine who is getting the next resource as there's a resource available. And so through coordinated entry, we work to prioritize the most vulnerable households for those resources as they're coming open. I think one of the big um, desires with prioritization and with coordinated entry in general is to make sure we're uh, reaching the folks who need help the most um, and to have a centralized and streamlined process to do that. So that in the past, perhaps if folks, you know, had to go to multiple organizations, which each had their own criteria, um, that potentially could favor folks who are best able to advocate for themselves. Um, and so I think it's an ongoing challenge to live up to it. But one of the big goals of CAM and coordinating entry is to make sure we're reaching those uh, people who are most vulnerable. And then so in terms of prioritization in practice, um, what that looks like. Uh, I think one thing that's just helpful to know, right, is I think a lot of people's interface with CAM might be really on that front door, which Ed was really speaking to, because that really is, uh, you know, if you call into the CAM phone line today, that's going to be the focus of our conversation is making sure you have a safe place to go tonight. Um, but beyond that, coordinated entering CAM is also then managing everything behind the scenes as folks are entering the homelessness system to connect them to appropriate services as there's openings. So we at the CAM Lead Agency uh, manage prioritization lists. I think we can go to the next slide um, that uh, are used in making those referrals. And so uh, I don't wanna get too in the weeds. If there's more questions, we definitely can dive deeper. Um, I think as I mentioned earlier, 
back in 2019, we started to change uh, the prioritization process as a COC um, and now have a model where we have four acuity groups um, that are used to uh, kind of group folks together according to vulnerability uh, for potential considerations for different resources. So folks in acuity group one um, are chronically homeless and scoring the highest on the SPDAT assessment tool. Uh, folks in acuity group two are scoring the highest on the SPDAT but are not chronic. Folks in acuity group three uh, are scoring lower on the tools and folks in acuity group four are scoring the lowest. Um, and so folks in AG1 are considered for permanent supportive housing. Folks in AG2 are considered for rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. Uh, folks in AG3 are just considered for rapid rehousing. And then folks in AG4 are not considered for any of the COC housing resources, but the desire to support them and connecting to other uh, mainstream resources and to self-resolve. Um, so I, that was a big mouthful. So again, happy to like get into the weeds of that. Um, but really the overall idea is to try and, um, you know, through all the assessment that Ed spoke to, um, having some sort of prioritization with the limited resources we have. And then there's additional factors that are considered within each of those acuity groups, which you can see on the screen. So on our end at the CAM lead, we're really managing all of the data and list of everyone that's currently experiencing homelessness and where they're at in the coordinated entry process. So as people are being navigated, that information is being sent to us so that we can add them onto the prioritization list. Um, currently, we use Salesforce to manage the actual um, like list, uh, as well as then we are posting copies in a protected format on our website so that providers, including navigators and street outreach, uh, can access that as well. As well. And a really big piece of this, especially for a key one, is coordinating with the navigation and street outreach teams to make sure that everyone who is experiencing homelessness is getting uh, properly added to the list so that they can be considered for a housing resource. Um, and for acuity group one in particular, there's some additional documentation uh, that goes with that. The navigators and street outreach put together packets that they submit to us. Uh, so again, happy to get into more details, but I think that's maybe a good general sense that we're, you know, it's a big uh, mix of coordination with partners, data management, and then following the policies and procedures and make making sure we're adhering those to, to those properly. Um, so to then the next slide, so that we then can refer folks to the housing resources. Um, so we make referrals uh, to transitional housing, rapid rehousing, and permanent supportive housing. Um, all of those program types are required to take their referrals through coordinated entry. Uh, so there's, CAM is really functioning as that centralized referral source. So as a provider has an opening in the program, uh, say NSOs, one of their PSH programs, uh, they have a vacancy. They're gonna report that to us as the CAM lead. And then as the CAM lead, we'll utilize those prioritization lists to make sure we're matching and referring uh, the person who's at the top of the prioritization list who meets, meets the criteria for that program and then send that referral to NSO so that they can then begin working with that household to get them uh, into permanent housing. Uh, so again, I think this piece of the work involves a lot of coordination and partnership managing all of those incoming referrals, following the policies to prioritization, to prioritize and refer folks. Um, and then there's also referral, um, I I'd say that coordination and consult that happens after that to make sure that folks are able to get connected. Uh, so we uh, currently facilitate the PSH consult group. We also participate in the provider work groups and are uh, really coordinating closely with navigators, street outreach, the housing providers, to make sure those households are getting connected. And I think we play kind of that middle person role as that connector, right? So maybe a housing program gets a referral, but they can't get a hold of that household. Uh, the CAM lead can play a role in making sure kind of the housing navigator and that housing provider are connected um, and making 
figuring out, you know, where is that person in the system? Can we make sure they get connected to that housing provider so they can get uh, move forward in the process? Um, and then sometimes also there's folks that are getting returned for various reasons. So we're also then managing as housing providers are not able to work with folks or if there's things that are coming up, we're making sure that we're following the COC's pre um, policies around that for what happens in those situations and ultimately making sure uh, clients are still um, on the appropriate list, still being considered for housing um, and doing all the tracking that comes along with that. Um, so I think that might be our last slide, certainly open to any, it looks like we're at our overall question and answers, but definitely in any of the details of CAM processes, happy to help address. Thanks, Scott and Ed. Um, so you all have had a chance to hear from Scott and Ed, who work directly at our current CAN lead agency, Southwest Counseling Solutions, and how they're currently implementing things on the ground. Um, we wanted to be able to provide you the access to them to ask questions as you're in your planning process alongside of the information that we have provided overall. Um, from a national perspective and a HUD perspective on what is needed to operate a coordinated entry. So I know that you all have had some um, opportunity to ask questions throughout, especially in the chat, but we wanted to also just make sure that we dedicate some time right now to uh, uh, some questions that you all may have as of right now. Um, and then as you all are uh, gearing up for your questions, just want to give you an overview of what you all can expect tomorrow. Uh, we're going to go into some details around the data and technology, um, some of the additional services beyond what you've already heard that uh, CAM provides. Um, we talked about YHDP, which is the Youth Homeless Demonstration Program, but there are some particular requirements around that that CAM has to be mindful of as they're implementing. And so we're going to go into details of that. Scott has hinted about, or not hinted, but he has definitely talked about how crucial partnerships are. Um, there are uh, housing providers, nonprofits that uh, we're partnering with, but there is a whole host of uh, formal and informal partnerships. And so we'll go into some details around that. Um, what staffing needs to look like and, and how CAM needs to be structured. I believe uh, Linda Stingle asked a question about how does getting CAM resources impact other resources that you can get for your agency. Um, but you also have to think about like, as uh, if I am also a, a provider of uh, housing, um, say a PSH program or our, a rapid rehousing program, how do I manage what may be a conflict of interest, for example, if I am then making my the CAM staff, if I'm the CAM lead agency, is then making a referral to one of the programs from our organization? So there is a lot to think about. Um, and then we're also going to share with you all some resources. Um, and uh, we'll walk through those tomorrow that, um, and you'll, I believe they're, if they're not already, they're posted to our website. Um, there's some questions for you all to consider that will really uh, help you to really start thinking about um, some of these uh, really interesting details and some of the nuances that you have to consider when you uh, serve as a CAM lead agency. So I'm gonna go back to this slide and just open, uh, again, open the floor for questions. Um, hi, Tasha. Hey, Linda. Hi. Um, do you want me to write my question in? No, or you can speak feel free it. To, you can okay. feel free to speak it. Um, so what is the like at Southwest is does it all happen in one place? Um, and how many staff are there or are you decentralized? Edward. Yes. Oh, um, Currently, we are all at Southwest Solutions. Um, we do work a hybrid schedule, so maybe not all the building at once. But access um, before going hot to the phone line only was being done at the HRC only. Now, uh, pre-COVID, it was spread out through different uh, different sites. Like the NSO Tumani we partnered with and also the NOAA projects the access sites. Right. Um, so currently, yeah, we have... Um, our information management team, which kind of does the 
girls, the prioritization of house choice vouchers are the, what else am I missing? Just general data, different things like that. All done in house. Um, same thing with access right now. Everything's within in the house. Now, our navigation team, though, that is um, a partnership with Community Home Sports. And um, they, like I said, they go to the shelters and, you know, complete the navigation for housing. I would say currently, when we were fully staffed, we were at about, I want to say, 27 to 30 people to run everything. Full time. Full time, Yes. All out of Southwest, not also um, NOAA and NSO? Yep, all through, everyone was employed through Southwest Solutions, correct. That's big. What role does, um, what role does Southwest play in transporting people who need help to where you're referring them to? Um, so, we do um, have, uh, so through finance and diversion, um, or I wouldn't say diversion necessarily, but we do have a Lyft account that we order Lyft. A Lyft. People. It is limited, um, of course, what we can do, but we do use Lyft. And then, I mean, we've also partnered with sometimes outreach teams, um, really just wherever, everywhere. We did have a pre-COVID, once again, we had agency vehicles that we would utilize. Um, so, I mean, depending on the time is kind of how, what we used, it really depended. Now, if somebody's already in shelter, you know, we're not providing a lift, but if they need to get from an access point to shelter, um, then yes, we would. You would provide a lift ride. Yep. Yeah, if they were at an access point or even wherever else that they called and identified a way there, then find that they cannot get somewhere. We would work on getting a lift. Now, I will, I will say though, if it is a family with a small child, they must have a car seat. Um, lift won't pick them up. Um, that has been an issue. Um, mm -hmm. To you like said, lift reluctance to. Well, they're not going to put a small child in the car. Um, you know, in a car. So that is. Um, Car seats definitely come in handy for if it's an agency that has their own fleet of vehicles. Because um, we do see a lot of families that do come, may need a way or have a small child, but, you know, plugging everything, you know, they have bags, they have their children, they have everything made for them to, you know, get back or get to a bus, you know, a bus route or something like that. All right. I see. Linda, what's that? Uh... Did that get to your question? Yeah, I have one more question. Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. And then I've got some in the chat that I'm going to take, but go ahead. So, so someone responded to me about the hours. So what happens after six? Like, yep. or on the weekend? Okay, so our phone line at 6 p.m. switches over to an uh, automated message. Um, of directing if people don't have a safe place to go, that they can walk into a shelter for the night as a list of the different shelters throughout the city and that they can contact CAM the following morning. So at 6 p.m., that switches over. So that message gives you, like if I needed housing, I would hear a list of organizations I could go to. For shelter, yes. If it was after 6 p.m a.m. depending on you know where you're at. Huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Gonna, thank you, Linda, and thank you, Ed. Um, we have a question in the chat from Geo Bartlett. It says, has use of Salesforce become an integral part of the current lead agency assessment model? Um, and, and will the new lead agency be required to use this software as well? So I think Han can probably take that second part, but Scott or Ed, if one of you all can address the first question. So I would say yes, um, it is an integral part of what we do. Um, our prioritization lists, referrals, um, navigation scheduling, just to name a few. Even our phone system is actually out of 
through Salesforce in a way. Um, it's through Vonage, but it runs through Salesforce. But a lot of our lists and um, referral uh, situation prioritizations are through Salesforce. Scott, you might have more to add to that. Yeah, I know it's on the agenda tomorrow as well for even more detail, but I would say broadly, like certainly Salesforce is not the only way to implement coordinated entry, but I do think it's a significant system that we currently use to manage parts of coordinated entry that we're required to do. So that coordination, as Ed was saying, with all of our navigation partners, tracking the prioritization, the prevention assessment, I think we'll go into it more tomorrow, everything that kind of currently is used in the systems. So I'd say that's the system we've built out over time to manage those pieces of the work. And that work needs to happen, uh, right? Uh, and I guess I'll turn it back over to Tasha in terms of how the COC is thinking about, yeah. <laughs> that. Thanks, Scott. Um, so as Scott mentioned, you know, as Scott and Ed mentioned, Salesforce has become an integral part of the, the system. I. We have a CAM transition team uh, that's comprised uh, of a lot of members of the community that are helping us to decide or make some recommendations on uh, some of these things, like should Salesforce be a requirement going forward? Um, and so in the preliminary discussions that we've had with that particular team, um, they're leaning towards it not being a requirement, but some sort of CRM uh, software um, would be required. So Scott was talking earlier about like, uh, as you're doing the four core elements of a coordinated assessment, one of the things he mentioned is like, uh, part of their work is, uh, the data and the technology, right? It becomes integral in managing such a, a complex system. And so HMIS alone may not be able to, uh, achieve all of the things that are required, or maybe not in the best manner to achieve all of the things that are required. And so I think for us, what we're going to be looking towards if we don't require the use of Salesforce is that you're still able to meet the outcomes and expectations that uh, Southwest is currently meeting through the use of Salesforce. So if not that, some sort of similar software that can meet the same uh, requirements. Let's see what else we have in a chat uh, from Jamie. Hey, Jamie, how are you? It says, if if it was our answered already, I apologize, but what is currently used as match? Um, I don't know if anyone from Southwest is able to speak to that. If not, I think we can follow up Jamie with. Um, yeah, I can, I can, let me just say, uh, so yeah, I, I, if, I see Jane is on the call. She wants to give more specifics. I will say in general. So over the years, um, Southwest, like every other COC recipient, um, may uh, identify different sources of match for, the, for their grant. Some years it may be match source A. Some years it may be a different match source. Um, you know, that's not uncommon uh, to identify you know, varying sources of match for COC grants over the years. Um, as you can see, and I'm going to just kind of speak in generalities here, I'll uh, certainly invite uh, anyone from South Boston wants to get more specific, but over the years, they've used different sources of private funding, um, different sources of uh, you know, public funding, again, the sources of which are allowable to be used as match. Um, so, it's it's varied over the years, you know. Honestly, I will say right now the um, source of funding the that Southwest has is currently using as match for the current CESSO grant. Right now, that doesn't look to be a source of funding that we know will be transferable to the new lead agency. Um, so we're we're kind of right now hedging a little bit on. At least I am. <laughs> I don't know if I feel comfortable like naming exactly what that source is because right now it doesn't look like that's a source that even would be available to the new lead agency. If that changes in the you know coming weeks, uh, that's you know a level of detail again that we can disclose in the RFQ. Um, so, and so Jamie, is there any current funding for CAM able to be used as match? So. In terms of the current funding, I mean, so essentially there's there's the three, but then really three sources of funding that can be transferred, transferable to the new lead agency. So the HUD, COC grant, 
uh, the MISPA ESG and the YHDP grant. And Tasha did respond to the question earlier in the chat, but the MISPA ESG um, is not able to be used as match. I don't think YHDP can also be used as match because that's essentially matching COC funds with COC funds and that YHDP money is COC money. Um, so the, the match that the new lead agency will need to identify will essentially need to be another source of funding um, that will have to be identified. So I hope that helps. <laughs> And maybe just to add on to that, Amanda, um, it, it could be already a source of funding that you all uh, at your currently have at your agency. So let's say, for example, you are currently receiving some private uh, like foundation money or um, something that of that sort, or maybe you even have another federal source that is matchable with this federal source. Um, and, you know, the activities are eligible, you know, the all of the requirements are around match, but um, it could be a, a, a source of funding that you already have. Um, we also don't, you don't rule out in kind because in kind is a way to meet match as well, as you all know, with uh, HUD funding. And so, there may be volunteers and uh, different things that uh, you, uh, uh, different partnerships and services that those partnerships bring that you all are able to tap into as an uh, in kind uh, match. So uh, I, I don't, I think Linda go ahead, Amanda. Have a question. Yes. Yeah, I just have a request for tomorrow. I wonder if. Scott and Edward could speak on Southwest behalf, um, maybe some lessons learned in passing the torch to the next organization or just a couple of highlights. I think for, I, for tomorrow, for tomorrow. I would be happy to speak from, I, I guess, my perspective and experience. I, I don't think that would fully speak to like Southwest as an agency. Um, I think with how, yeah, I, I don't know how to fully answer that. I think it might be. Yeah, your experience would be good. That'll yeah, be good. I can speak to my uh, experience. For, Not representative of Southwest. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, and I think we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but there is just an interest, like CAM functions, like I think the language, the COC is used as like an entity within an entity. So it's kind of like, function as its own little bubble in a sense. And so I think I can speak to maybe some of the dynamics from within that bubble at CAM. But yeah, I think certainly that might be different than some of the considerations like agency leadership might have in terms of what it takes to take this on and how it's managed from that perspective. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I uh, want to give you all an opportunity. If uh, someone has a, a question you want to get answered today, feel free to come off of mute or type it in the chat. All right. We, uh, hand staff and CAM staff, will stay on the line for maybe another five minutes or so. Um, so if there's anyone that wants to hang on a little bit after and you have some more questions that you would like to get answered, feel free to hang on with us. Otherwise, I guess we're giving you, uh, let's see, a whole 35 minutes back into your day. Um, we do hope to see you all tomorrow. As I shared, there's a lot more detail that we'll be going in tomorrow around the data and technology and the staffing structure, um, things of that sort, um, the additional services that CAM provides. Um, I think the biggest thing, if I can impress upon you today and even tomorrow and in your planning, is just, just recognizing that this is a system that you're planning for and not just a program. And so you are going to have to consider, um, as Scott mentioned, not only how folks, you know, access the, that that front office stuff, right, the, the access, but you have to think about the data, 
and the technology uh, that is required to pull some of this off. You'll have to think about policies and procedures. And this is not just for your organization. So a lot of times these policies and procedures have to be decided on on a community basis, right? Um, there may be things that come up where uh, what's best for the CAM lead agency may conflict with what's best for your agency as a whole, as a nonprofit. And so how do you handle things like that? How do you make sure you separate uh, the staff that is running the CAM from the staff that is running other housing programs? Um, definitely a lot to consider, um, but these are the things that are crucial to make sure that uh, they're in play in order to really uh, run the system and uh, run a system that is fair and is accessible. And most importantly, it is um, uh, community oriented and, and, and designed specifically for the people who are going to be utilizing the services. Jamie, I see your hand up. You want to come off a mute? Yeah, so I believe that when the letter of intent came out, like I was looking up some documentation and it stated something about, I, f I feel like it stated this, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, that full staffing for CAM was approximately 39 staff members. And today it was mentioned that full staffing is approximately 27 staff. And so I was wondering is if, if there's any way to maybe take a deeper dive tomorrow into like org chart roles and responsibilities and that operates CAM, just so um, we as potential, like, you know, agencies applying for the RFP can really have kind of an understanding of like who does what and how and like how those roles and responsibilities are split up again, like across like CAM. Yeah, absolutely. We got a whole section <laughs> on staffing where we actually do go into the um, some of the um, expectations for how many staff going forward. Uh, they uh, there's an organizational chart that's going to be presented and um, some discussion on like some of those roles and responsibilities. Uh, Scott or Ed, anything to add there? I think we'll get into it more tomorrow, but Jamie, just for context, I think where that was coming from is the the 27 currently would be like the currently, like at Southwest, how many positions are designated and if we hired all of those. And I think we had been asked to come up with like what we thought would be like ideal staffing levels to fully meet the need, recognizing, I think we've heard pretty continuously, there's challenges with folks accessing CAM, uh, including concerns around, you know, after hours, weekends, just general managing volume. So I think that's where those two sets of numbers came from. And I think as Tasha said, we we'll, can definitely dive in more tomorrow. Okay. So basically like 39 would be the, maybe the ideal number. Whereas right now like funding is for if fully funded, it would be the 27 staff. I'll defer to Tasha on the funding piece of that. I don't know that 39 is like, you know, I think that's somewhat best guessing. So I like, I don't want to say 100%. That's like the ideal amount of camp staff. But I think, um, yeah, I think generally we feel like there could be benefit from having a much higher level of access staff uh, in particular. Um, but I'll pass it back over to Tasha on the other piece of that. Hi, Jamie. Yeah, there is uh, also some balance between what funding will be available um, at the time of the RFQ and how that will play out with staffing. Um, I think as Scott has mentioned, uh, we're certainly looking at like what are more optimal levels of staffing given some of the uh, concerns that we have heard in terms of, you know, maybe not being able to get through the CAM call center. Um, and so, you know, there. Uh, so, so based on that, we have also kind of identified like what are more optimal levels of staffing and um, what resources, if any, uh, the newly agency may be able to bring to the table to achieve some of those optimal staffing levels. Thank you. That is super helpful. No problem. All right. Well, like I said, we'll hang on the line for a few extra uh, minutes. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to chime in. 
Uh, thank you all so much for your interest. Uh, this is a, a, a really critical component of our system. Um, and so we don't take it lightly. Um, and we want to make sure that those of you who are considering it um, have, a, have, a, have, have enough information as possible to really put forth a, a uh, your best step in the application process. So um, I mentioned earlier, we'll be sharing some resources which may already be posted to our website under the CAM transition section. And if not, we'll be getting those up soon and we'll definitely talk about them tomorrow as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to our presenter today, uh, some of my fellow colleagues at hand, um, and also uh, our partners at uh, Southwest uh, Counseling, Southwest Solutions, um, and we'll be joining you all again tomorrow to, to go into even further depth about some of the other things. Um, a question from Paige, are we going to share the slides? Yes, we will uh, send out the slide deck. We will also be sharing the recording um, from uh, this and tomorrow's workshop as well. Folks, well, it's 11.35. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the meeting, and I will see everyone tomorrow. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.